Hello everyone, my name is Abhiral Kumar and I'll talk about value-based deep reinforcement learning requires explicit regularization. And this is joint work with Rishabh Agarwal, Aaron Kurwal, Tengyuma, George Tucker and Sergey Levin. So what exactly is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is a paradigm that allows us to train agents that, that are capable of making effective sequential decisions. A typical reinforcement learning or RL training paradigm looks like this. An agent interacts periodically with the environment, collecting its own data, and then trains the policy on this, on, on this data set as well as the past history of experience that has been collected by the same agent. Typical RL algorithms operate in the following way. They first estimate something that is known as a Q function or a, a, an estimate of how good the policy is doing on the long-term reward, and then improve the policy against this estimate. Now, under Markov assumptions, which are very typical in reinforcement learning, these, uh, these Q functions satisfy a recursive relation, which is also known as the Bellman equation that you can see on your slide. And therefore, modern deep RL algorithms that train parametric uh, Q functions, uh, neural network Q functions, essentially convert this Bellman equation, this recursion, into a trainable objective by, for, for instance, computing the, the residual error between the two sides of the Bellman equation. And this error is also known as the temporal difference error. And these methods would then train a parametric neural network Q function to minimize this error um, and optionally collect more data and perform more training. Now this training is typically done via gradient descent and uh, one important feature of this uh, temporal difference error is that you train a Q function to match targets generated from its own previous snapshot. As in the targets are not fixed labels as you would expect in supervised learning, but these are actually labels that are, that are generated from a previous snapshot of the same Q function. And this is also known as bootstrapping. Now deep RL algorithms suffer from a number of optimization challenges. For example, performance may go up and come back down as you train more. Learning can be unstable and even uh, uh, errors that are training errors can go up with more training. For example, here we consider a simple scenario where uh, we actually observe that more training per data point leads to sort of an underfitting effect rather than an overfitting effect. So in this uh, learning curve that you see here, there are three lines. The red line corresponds to train, making one gradient step per data point in your data set on an average. The blue line is four gradient steps per data point on an average. And the orange line is eight gradient steps per data point on an average. And this performance curve, uh, so here the, the y-axis is the performance of the policy, sort of resembles a lot like overfitting, where you're making more updates and you lead to a poor performance or poor generalization. But turns out that even the training temporal difference error is larger when you, uh, when you make, make more, more updates. So it's very counterintuitive that you train more and you, you, you see uh, underfitting rather than overfitting. So what are the concrete problem statement that we can use to understand the challenges with deep RL methods? Now deep RL methods consist of several factors where they would collect their own data periodically and then train on this data that was collected, which reduces a non-stationary data distribution and a non-stationary data set size. And all of this is in addition to the, the different objective in, in RL, which is quite different from supervised learning. So to disentangle the effects of, many, of these many factors, we consider a setting where the agent is not allowed to perform active data collection in the environment and is already provided with a big data set from previously collected interactions. And all it has to do is to train a policy using this fixed offline data set. And this is also known as the offline reinforcement learning problem setting. In this case, we can formalize the data set as a sequence of transitions taken by a behavior policy in the environment, which is not the same as the learned policy. Now, to understand what optimization challenges exist in this offline deep RL settings, we would consider the, the representations learned by a nonlinear deep Q function uh, in, 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 the, in the case of offline RL. And arguably, representations learned by a network can potentially shed light on the questions of what optimization issues we face because the quality of representations will be indicative of what kind of solutions the optimization, uh, optimization process prefers. Let's start with a somewhat funny experiment. So in this experiment, we'll take the offline data set and we'll run some sort of Q-learning uh, on this data set. Now, the Q function in this case is a deep neural network Q function, where we denote the last but one layer feature output of this Q function as phi of SA, and we'll call it the features or the representations learned by the Q function. We'll compare two algorithms in this experiment where there's a supervised regression baseline, where the goal is to find a Q function by regressing to the sum of future rewards in a trajectory. And the second one is the standard Q-learning algorithm, where we use TD learning and we sample A prime from the policy that maximizes the Q function. The first quantity that we measure in this experiment is the dot product of the learned features at S A and S prime A prime. Note that these S A and S prime A prime tuples are exactly the state action tuples that appear on the two sides of the Bellman update for the Q learning case. 
And what we find here is that the dot products, as you can see on the plot in the, in the slide, that the dot products keep on growing as you train more and more on this offline data set. Now you may wonder why is this actually surprising because maybe this is just happening because the Q-learning algorithm is diverging. The reason why this is indeed surprising is because the output of the network, the output Q value of the network of the same very network is pretty much stable and constant over, over this training phase. So the Q values are pretty much the constant, whereas dot products still keep on increasing over time. Now this may still not be very surprising because maybe this could just be a property of the, of the, uh, of the particular task that we're evaluating it on. And so we run supervised regression as well here. And what we find to our surprise is that for supervised regression, not only are the Q values pretty stable, so not only it has converged in the, in the output space, but even the dot product similarities over the course of training exhibit a pretty stable constant trend, as you can see in the red line on the plot. What this means is perhaps there's some, some, something going on with bootstrapping that makes the features uh, at SA and S prime A prime similar to each other as you train more. And this phenomenon is what we'll call feature co-adaptation. And what we do in this work is we try to understand why this feature co-adaptation happens and how it is related to bootstrapping. Now, why are high feature dot products actually bad from the context of RL or from the context of learning a policy? So if you look at the bootstrapping update, the action E that appears on the left-hand side of the Bellman update is typically chosen from the data set or the behavior policy. Action A prime, which appears on the right-hand side is chosen from the learned policy. Now, when the dot products between phi of SA and phi of S prime A prime are quite high or they increase over the course of training, this implies that the actions from the data set, so A, the actions A, are represented similarly to actions from the learned policy A prime that appear on the right hand side. Now, imagine a scenario where you have a finite data set and you have not seen every A prime at the next state. In that case, bad actions from the policy, so bad A prime actions, which you have not seen, will end up getting alias to good actions from the data set A that you have seen. And so you might end up erroneously thinking that an unseen action that you haven't seen uh, at the next state A prime is actually quite good, whereas in, in reality, it's a very bad action to take. And this is precisely the problem in offline reinforcement learning algorithms. To empirically understand how high feature dot products correspond to poor performance, we run an experiment where we run two uh, offline RL algorithms, DQL and CQL, initialized from a good solution, and we track the trajectory found by TD learning. In this case, we find that ret the return of the policy degrades even when starting from these good solutions and dot products have a tendency to rise as more training progresses. Both of this happens when uh, the overall training error for both of these algorithms is still pretty low and is generally either uh, pretty, pretty, pretty much constant or decreasing uh, over the course of training. What this indicates is that TE learning algorithms can leave good solutions in the favor of maximizing dot products. So to understand what exactly about bootstrapping actually leads to increased dot products, we conduct a controlled experimental study, which still uses the finite data set and performs different kinds of uh, Bellman backups with different choices of A prime on this data set. Again, as before, we are interested in looking at the dot product between features at S A and S prime A prime. In this case, we evaluate two algorithms, uh, in sample SARSA and out of sample DD learning. In sample SARSA aims to compute the return of the behavior policy by performing Bellman backups from exactly the state action tuple S prime A prime that was seen in the trajectory in the data set. So A prime is exactly seen in the trajectory in the data set. Whereas out of sample TD learning aims to estimate the value of the behavior policy. So it's the same quantity as, as, as SARSA, but it does so by sampling a new action uh, from the stochastic behavior policy that generated a data set. So A prime is sampled from the behavior policy uh, and A prime may not be observed in the, in the static offline data set. Now, know that this should technically lead to similar predictions, which we see in the curve on the, on the second row, where the predictions are pretty much the same, and these are the output Q values learned by both of these methods. But on the other hand, the dot products of, uh, of TD learning actually keep on rising as you train more compared to the, the more stable trend in the dot products for SARSA. What this indicates is this indicates the presence of feature co-adaptation because the, the predictions are pretty much, uh, pretty much stable, but dot products are increasing when you use out of sample actions here. And what this means is, Feature dot products can increase for TD learning algorithms, uh, even when you uh, use unseen actions. Uh, and, and these actions could still be coming from, uh, from the same distribution as what generated the data set. So we're trying to compute uh, the same quantity. These actions are coming from the same distribution, but just because these actions are out of sample, uh, we, we see uh, an increased dot product. So why do feature dot products actually increase? Certainly, it's not because we are explicitly trying to do so. We are, there's no term in the ob objective that aims to explicitly maximize the dot products of features. 
And hence, what this means is that there is some implicit preference or implicit bias of the, of the training procedure towards maximizing dot products. Now, since this phenomenon doesn't quite arise in supervised learning in which the trend of dot products stabilizes, it's, uh, of, it, it, it's presumably caused by, by the two things, which is the fact that we are using TD error where we are regressing to targets generated from our own previous self, and we are optimizing this on a neural network with gradient descent. In supervised deep learning, uh, such phenomenon have been studied under the name of implicit regularization, which basically uh, is, is the following. So in a scenario where we're using a highly overparameterized neural network to minimize uh, some sort of training error, and when there are many solutions in the training uh, parameter landscape, which can give you this, give you a, a, a minima for the, for the training loss, turns out that gradient descent over this neural network starting from certain initializations prefers only a few solutions and these solutions can be characterized as the ones that minimize some sort of an implicit regularizer R theta. So we'll not converge to any solution on this landscape, but we'll converge to only those solutions that have the property of, uh, of minimizing some sort of an implicit regularizer uh, function. And uh, most of the analysis in deep learning and, uh, tries to analyze uh, what this implicit regularizer is for co commenting on what kind of solutions will be found by overparameterized networks. When optimizing supervised regression problems with stochastic gradient descent and noise, Blank et al. derived the implicit regularizer that suggests that uh, this kind of an optimization procedure prefers solutions that have a low value of the squared feature norm averaged out over the different training data points. Now, exceeding this analysis to TD learning is fairly complicated. One, because TD learning doesn't quite converge in general. And two, because the dynamics of TD learning is fairly hard to analyze due to certain terms being pretty much intractable. So we have to make some simplifying assumptions about uh, positive definiteness of certain matrices in, uh, that appear in the dynamics of TD learning, which allows us to handle both of these issues. And in such scenarios, we can uh, we, de we derive the implicit regularizer for running noisy SGD on TD error and found that this regularizer now has two terms. The first term is identical to what you find in supervised learning. And the second term is an additional term that, uh, that puts an additional pressure to maximize the dot products at, uh, at S A and S prime A prime. And this is exactly the quantity that we measured in our experiments and we found that it was increasing over time. So what this means is that in, uh, under uh, conditions where TD learning would converge, the solutions it would converge to would have highly similar features for S A and S prime A prime. This also has some nice connections to how self-supervised learning methods such as BYOL and SIMCM uh, it can be argued that they essentially use this implicit regularization uh, 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 phenomenon to learn effective representations for uh, uh, a particular input image because in, uh, in that scenario, S A and S prime A prime are just uh, uh, two different augmented versions of the same image and you're maximizing their dot products which is expected to keep only the invariant information from the image uh, in the representation. So now since we saw that uh, there's an implicit regularization effect towards, uh, towards, uh, towards learning representations that have a high dot product or that are between SA and S prime A prime or that are highly co-adapted, can we somehow undo this implicit regularization? And to, uh, to do this, can we somehow derive an explicit regularizer that can convert this implicit regularizer that we derived for TD learning uh, to match or to resemble more like uh, the implicit regularizer for supervised learning, which we know empirically at least uh, leads to simpler solutions and generalizes better. And to do so, our method DR3 essentially adds an explicit regularizer that aims to minimize the dot product. So it's directly undoing the effect of the second term in the TD learning, uh, in the TD learning uh, implicit regularizer. And this prevents co-adapted representations and makes TD behave more like supervised learning. In fact, in some of the problems that we have seen in some earlier work where we saw that TD learning leads to, to really low rank representation, so representations whose ranks have actually collapsed, turns out that, uh, that when you add the DR3 regularizer during training, uh, TD learning actually uh, gives rise to high rank representations, which is pretty much like what we get from supervised learning on this domain. So it makes it more like supervised learning. So how does DR3 empirically perform? To, to, to understand this, we are looking at two, two main aspects. The first aspect is whether DR3 gives rise to more stable learning trends. So we want to make sure that there's no catastrophic unlearning over the course of training. And second, we want to see if DR3 leads to better performance. So to do so, we extensively evaluate DR3 on a number of tasks. And in the plots that you see in the slide, uh, we, we apply DR3 on top of two base offline RL methods, REM and CQL. So these are the two rows. We evaluate DR3 on three different data set compositions, and these are the three columns. And all of these plots are averaged out over 17 different Atari games. Now, uh, in, in these plots, we essentially plot the performance, which is shown on the y-axis of the policy. 
as a function of how many gradient steps are taken on the fixed offline data set that is provided to us. In all these curves, note that at the addition of DR3, which is shown in the blue line, uh, stabilizes the algorithm substantially. And while base algorithms have this unlearning phenomenon where they would go, where the performance would go up and come back down, uh, the addition of DR3 essentially removes this and the performance is pretty stable. Also note that DR3 essentially ends up rising to a higher performance uh, than the base offline algorithm as well. To summarize, we discussed how implicit regularization effects can lead to bad stuff in, in, in sort of Q-learning and TD-learning, such as co-adaptation, aliasing, poor representations, etc. Um, what this means is that we need to really add an explicit regularizer to deep Q-learning algorithms to make them learn good features. And this is especially important with finite data sets and limited samples. And our approach significantly stabilizes and improves naive TD learning algorithms. Thank you.